Um, so, Dave Lucas is um, a, char a character tourist since 1994, graduated in 2001 in geographic information, uh, the area that will be key to an integrated global resource management system. He's been a member of TZM since 2011 and has produced the TZM UK newsletter and is currently admin uh, administrator for the Economic Safety Net on Facebook. Please welcome Dave Lucas. Hi folks. All right. Key questions for Zeitgeisters are, what does the route map to RBE transition look like? And what's our next logical step along that journey? Sorry, yeah. Are we looking at the bigger route map that has already been unfolding throughout human history and the trigger mechanisms that brought about each previous paradigm shift? Then we might get a clearer model of the dynamics already afoot, taking us to the next paradigm shift and the processes through which we can naturally outgrow our obsolescent institutions just as our ancestors did theirs. But firstly, what might be the logical long-term route map for the future of humanity? Does the natural law, resource-based uh, economy, represent a final utopian endgame for human endeavour, or is it merely an intermediate step on a much bigger journey? String theory co-founder Dr. Michio Kaku often refers to the Kardashev scale as a clarifying benchmark to put humanity's future stages in some perspective. In their search for extraterrestrial intelligence, astrophysicists use the Kardashev scale to classify possible civilizations that might have had a head start over us, measuring hundreds, thousands, or millions of years. The scale uses three theoretical categories according to levels of energy and information capacity achieved. Type 1 is a planetary civilization, one that has harnessed the entire energy content of its home planet and attained levels of engineering capability allowing control over its, all its natural forces, including the climate, weather and global seismic activity in popular sci-fi, the world of Buck Rogers. Type 2 is a stellar civilization, one that has harnessed the entire power of its mother star has the capacity to re-engineer its entire solar system and to meet its needs, has access to neighbouring star systems. Think the world of Star Trek. Type 3 is a galactic civilization, one that's harnessed the power of its entire galaxy and learned to manipulate the fabric of space-time as a logistical system, the world of Star Wars. On this scale, <coughs> Jacques Fresco's resource-based economy is a Type 1 civilization as it could appear if constructed with today's technology, illustrating that this is not a utopian vision, but one of many logical milestones in a process that would take us out into the stars, keeping us busy and perpetually on the move for perhaps millions of years. Stephen Hawking advises us it would be foolish to keep all humanity's eggs in one planetary basket by stopping at a Type 1. Our planet's vulnerability to extinction-level impacts is well understood, and eventually our own sun will no longer be able to sustain life. Today's divided world, still relying on dead plants and for energy, is a Type 0.7 civilization. Michio Kaku estimates that we will reach Type 1 status in between 100 and 200 years from now, if we can get through our adolescent growing pains quickly enough to avoid destruction at the hands of our own inertia, short-sightedness and folly. From inventor Raymond Kurzweil's perspective, the singularity is perhaps only 30 years away a point in history where the ever-accelerating pace of technological advancement exceeds humans' ability to comprehend it, at a time at which we will start to need to interface with it ourselves in order to actually have the intelligence to manage it. So, the goal of our generation is to get safely past the four horsemen ushering out the old paradigm, through the type 0.8 and 0.9 stages, and arrive at a type 1 civilization in one piece. But what technical infrastructure do we need to put in place first? What skills do we need? And how might we acquire them? Jeremy Rifkin, senior business lecturer, author, political advisor, and founder on the Foundation on Economic Trends, points out that throughout history, every new economic paradigm has arisen through a new general operating platform combining three emergent regimes of technology. One is a new and more efficient form of energy to make possible the more complex physical processes of design, production and economic activity. Two, a new and more efficient form of communication, giving a larger percentage of the population access to the education and information exchange they need to manage a more complex energy regime. 
and three, a new and more efficient form of transport and logistics to coordinate movement of all the products and materials and enable supply chains to be established over longer distances. And significantly, <clears throat> each new level also gives rise to a broader level of consciousness amongst the population. Here are some historical examples. Hunter-gatherer societies, their energy regime was manual, the communication was oral, limited to storytelling and instructions passed on from parent to child. Logistics was on foot, and consciousness was mythological. That is, local gods that served only the local family group, so that the, the tribe over the next hill were demonised. Then came the great hydraulic civilizations, for example, Egypt and Mesopotamia. The energy was now assisted by beasts of burden and metal smelting technologies, enabling a more capable mechanical tool set for irrigation, agriculture and manufacture, supporting large human settlements, labour division and social hierarchies. The communication was a written word, permanently recording larger bodies of information to be passed down and improved. Logistics was animals rowing boats, coordinating energies of multiple workers. And the consciousness shifted to theological, People now became virtual members of an extended family by, uh, by virtue of a shared faith. Then, in the late medieval period, came the soft proto-industrial revolution, in which feudalism began to evolve towards the market economy. Energy now came from water mills and windmills, enabling a more efficient and profitable wool-fulling industry, which hitherto had been too uh, prohibitive uh, in labour-intensive, leading to enclosures acts and expulsion of less efficient tenant farmers, perhaps the first wave of technological unemployment. The communication regime was the printing press. Information became more widely available to more people, allowing them to question authority, hence the rise of Protestantism. Logistics was road systems run by turnpike trusts. <clears throat> Mathematical instruments, such as the astrolabe, enabling long-range marine navigation for transoceanic routes giving former tenant farmers passage to new lives in new world colonies, such as Canada. Consciousness was now extended to kingdoms. Then came the first industrial revolution of the early 19th century, the age of the British Empire. Energy was now coal-fired steam engines, powering new urban mills. Communication was steam-powered printing presses, later the telegraph, educating ever greater generations of technical workers and enabling longer-range governance. Logistics came from steam, steam railways and steam ships, now capable of reliant, reliable ocean navigation thanks to precise chronometers measuring longitude. Consciousness moved to the nation-state nation level. Next came the Second Industrial Revolution, the age of the US and Soviet empires. Energy was now centralized electricity grids, internal combustion engines, communication, telephone and radio, later television. Logistics was oil-powered vehicles enabling globalised supply chains, and consciousness moved to regional alliances, NATO, EU, and the Warsaw Pact. Unlike the modest, personal, often family-owned businesses that dominated prior, the first and second industrial epochs required huge centralised hierarchical corporate structures, funded by many shareholders to efficiently fund, plan, build out, and manage the vast infrastructures necessary for the key energy, communications, and logistics industries to operate, with other industries harmonising with their business models for them to gain efficiency gain. The result was the powerful, impersonal corporate entities we see today with their problematic levels of influence over governments. In the last two years, the International Energy Agency has reported that the capital costs per barrel of oil extraction have been rising exponentially since 2006, indicating that this was the year of peak oil production, long forecast by the geologist M. King Hubbard. The financial crisis of 2008, the year of TZM's birth, represented the end of growth for the second industrial revolution and its oil-dependent industries. And so rises the third industrial revolution, defined by the integration of the operating platform of the three internets, energy in the form of distributed renewables, uh, running through smart grids managed peer-to-peer -peer via the Internet of Energy. Communication, a maturing Internet of Communication, offering a powerful social commons, massive open online courses and platforms for digital democracy. Logistics comes from automated driverless vehicles and goods retrieval systems, localised production using 3D printing, managed peer-to-peer -peer via the Internet of Things. Consciousness is now split level, both localised for efficient autonomous productivity and globalised for responsible citizenship of the biosphere as a whole. The millennial generation are showing a trend of abandoning the desire for ownership in favour of access. For renewable energy, the wind blows and the sun shines everywhere. 
and requires distributed, laterally scaled and collaborative architecture to harness them, rather than the old, inefficient, centralised, vertically scaled model from the second industrial revolution. Information goods can now be instantly shared globally, including education. Universities now offer massive open online courses, enabling the best lecturers to run degree courses to classes with thousands of students distributed worldwide, flattening knowledge hierarchies. Ever more sophisticated physical products can also be developed and shared via global open source networks, as we've heard earlier today. Downloaded and 3D printed locally using recycled waste materials as feedstocks with less specialist skills needed locally. The field of 3D printing has expanded to incur, uh, included to, sorry, has expanded to include contour crafting, as we've seen, an automated technique for house building and bioprinting, the automated manufacture of organ tissue for medicine. Driverless vehicles, drones and sensors freely connect everyone with everything, cutting out the middlemen. The advent and integration of these technologies is giving birth to the Internet of Things. More people, enabled by ever smarter wizards, apps and analytics, become prosumers, producers as well as consumers of goods and services. New food production technologies such as Douglas Millett's cybernated farm systems will enable the Internet of Things to expand to cover food production as well. Hence, large centralised corporations are losing the advantage that economy of scale and scarcity once gave them over small local producers, and will need to outgrow their inefficient second industrial revolution architecture in order to survive at all as the years come. <coughs> New communications platforms such as Vocalised Digital Democracy engage communities directly in the process of arriving at key dec decisions organically, and will render obsolete the ironclad brontosaurus of the centralised left-right divided government institution. More and more goods and services are thus being ephemeralised, in the words of R. Buckminster Fuller, and made available to an increasingly internet-connected world at approaching zero marginal cost, placing them outside the control of the market system, beyond money itself. We've already seen this revolution in homemade music videos, blogs and newsletters, putting many companies out of business. And as the internets of energy and things develop and integrate, we'll see it increasingly with electricity and physical goods as well. The open source community emerging from this paradigm is known as the collaborative commons, the embryonic resource-based economy. The non-profit sector hosting this commons has been growing by 13% per annum since, 19, uh, sorry, since 2008, whilst the market economy has more or less stagnated. The third industrial revolution master plan was developed over 11 years in a partnership between Jeremy Rifkin and a consortium of top business and political leaders. It is designed as a nodal system for regions to transition into a progressive, sustainable energy economy through collaboration. The five pillars of the TIR are, firstly, convert into renewable energy uh, economy. Secondly, convert buildings into solar and wind microgenerators, resulting in a distributed, democratised, peer-to-peer energy grid. Three, install a hydrogen battery system for storing surplus energy for later use. Four, install an internet of energy smart grid infrastructure enabling the internet to share home-produced energy in the same peer-to-peer -peer fashion as information is today. And five, install a network of recharge points for electric vehicles to replace fossil fuel-powered logistics. The initiative has been formally endorsed by the EU, the UN, and TIR master plans have been developed for Germany, Denmark, Utrecht in the Netherlands, Nord-Path de Calais in France, Italy and Monaco. Angela Merkel, a physicist by training, is leading the World Showcase TIR Master Plan. Germany now has over a million buildings retrofitted as wind solar microgenerators, generating 28% of the country's total electricity supply and employing tens of thousands of technicians in local energy cooperatives. Energy companies are beginning to accept a new role as facilitators of the infrastructure, earning fees from maximising energy efficiency on behalf of energy prosumers they serve, rather than being providers of energy. More recently, China made a commitment to becoming a world leader in the third industrial revolution, setting aside $82 billion for the development of a smart grid system for the country. If they are to avoid being hopelessly left behind, moribund and technologically unemployed amid their crumbling second industrial revolution infrastructures, the rest of the world must soon come on board with the third industrial revolution and benefit from the wealth of experience already being gained in mainland Europe. And when they do, this will usher in the most ambitious and globally coordinated feat of civil engineering and the last wave of mass employment in human history, 
lasting 30 to 40 years as we train technicians, gear up the industry and build up the new infrastructure, expanding the Internet of Things until it connects every human on Earth with everything they need. The Schumacher Institute is the UK's most active organisation in pursuing a TIR agenda and a natural choice for developing the massive open online courses to train the new TIR workforce with all the technical skills that it will need. A possible role for a Zeitgeist Movement UK-based social cooperative enterprise might include raising support for research and development for a TIR master plan for the UK, perhaps in partnership with the Schumacher Institute, raising support for the development of the massive online open courses for TIR technical training for communities, raising support for development of open source platforms, blockchain distributed autonomous organisations and digital democratic software platforms, and seeking collaboration with potential partners, for example, colleges and universities, technology companies and local authorities. And finally, here is a list of other organisations you may want to contact in furthering your own field of interest relating to transition. And hopefully we'll be able to email these to you. And that's it. If, we, if Dave can just take a few questions relevant to his talk, and whilst he's doing that, we're going to set up some chairs here for uh, the Q&A. Could we get the speakers, any, any prior speakers who are still here, um, Martin, to just come up on stage and share the Q&A with us, if, if you would? You, yeah, Sh sure, yeah, do, yeah, about a couple of minutes away. So I'll hand over the mic to Dave whilst we're busy getting that together. There you go. Okay, thank you. I'm um, sorry, you still... Any questions? There's no questions. No questions, no? Uh, one, no. <laughs> um, hello. My question, again, would be, um, you're referring to the third industrial revolution. I was wondering if, because to me it sounds that all the technology we've built so far in the past 15, 20 years, are not so much a revolution, but so like a, a, the edge of everything that was previously discovered in the 60s, you know, transition and computing power and so on. And so the Moore's law, everyone kind of believes comes to a close end. I was just wondering um, if there are skeptics or if what you think can, defines this as a revolution and not as an ending of the previous technologies, you know? Uh, sorry, I'm not caught with you. Yeah, so I, I'm a bit of skeptic of calling the, what you define so far as a revolution, as the third technological revolution, where you, define, you refer to it as what comes next or what we already achieved? Well, what I've, just, what I've described is a combination of a third industrial revolution, which is basically the, uh, the stage transition over to a democratized uh, transition to renewable energy production, which is, of course is in the hands of um, prosumers, individuals generating their own electricity and sharing across a grid as opposed to the old model of a centralised uh, hierarchical company generating the electricity centrally and farming it out to everybody else. So that brings about a fundamental change. People then become prosumers of their own energy. That then builds the infrastructure. So now, rather than the internet of communication, which we have now, we have now a much, much more um, comprehensive and stronger uh, internet, which is basically a platform for sharing not only information goods, but energy goods as well. And that increasingly in includes uh, 3D printing um, uh, share technologies like Thingiverse, if you're familiar with Thingiverse and the maker, uh, 3D printer maker um, community. These things are building into a general operating platform which gives people the democratized uh, power to actually produce more and more stuff bypassing the monetary uh, uh, system. So the market system will still be there, it will just shrink in its, uh, in its influence. So increasingly it will shrink into a niche market. So eventually what we'll see is we'll see more and more people um, able to have their needs met uh, bypassing the monetary system because you've got the Internet of Things, which then gives you your energy, your food potentially, uh, you know, any, any 3D printed goods that you can think of, uh, while more specialised and maybe high tech uh, goods and services, which uh, still do require monetary uh, exchange, will actually shrink to a point where they're actually affecting uh, the less and less people directly. Does that answer the question? Yeah. 